times, because we're unable to gather as a congregation to worship on Sunday, I'm delivering the sermon so it can be seen online. And this is the assigned lectionary gospel passage, John 9, 1 through 41. And before I read the scripture, I want to have a word of prayer. Gracious God, there's a lot of anxiety and unknowns in the world and in our country right now with the coronavirus. People are sick, people have died, and we're not over with it yet. So our prayers you hold this world close to you, each family affected, help to cease the spread of it and get a handle on it. To make sure that everyone can receive care that needs it and that we would be able to adjust to the differences of our daily lives now and that they won't have to last for too many weeks and that we can get back to normal and certainly get back to worshiping together as our faith community here at all of it we pray all this in jesus name amen john 9 1 through 41 a man born blind receives sight. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while in his day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, it is he. Others were saying, no, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened the eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes. Then I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who was a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then? Does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I've told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God 
has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees heard him say this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. All of us have probably played a blindfold game at least once in our lives. We were blindfolded as a child while we swung a bat to break a pinata. We had our eyes covered as we tried to pin the tail on a donkey. There is an old game show that was popular back in the 1950s and 60s called What's My Line? The panel tried to guess a person's occupation by asking yes or no questions. At the end of each show, there was a famous person, usually a television or movie star, who was the guest, and they were to try to figure out who it was. So the panel members were blindfolded because, of course, they would recognize the celebrity. And again, the panel could ask only yes or no questions, and the star would try to disguise their voice. Surprisingly, the panel guessed correctly much of the time, even though their eyes were covered. Now, I haven't been blindfolded many times in my life, but I can tell you that I don't like it at all. Not being able to see causes anxiety. Fortunately, the blindfold is not on for very long, and you know you're going to see again once it is removed. At least there is some comfort in that. The blind man in today's gospel passage did not know that comfort. He was born blind, so he had no memory of seeing at all. He could not pull off a blindfold and receive sight he had never known. Because the man was born blind, the disciples asked Jesus a very interesting question. And because the man probably could hear them, it was a hurtful question. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? People really thought that a person's infirmity was the result of some sin. Either it was hereditary, meaning that the sins of the fathers were visited upon the children to the third and fourth generations, or the person himself had sinned. Jesus immediately shoots down their assumptions, saying, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. He was not being punished for anything he or his ancestors had done. God doesn't work that way. Instead, Jesus moves the discussion to what God will bring out of the man's blindness rather than what lies behind it. Jesus then approaches the man, scooped up a handful of dirt, spit on it, and made a muddy paste. Now that sounds gross to us, but in the ancient world, saliva was believed to have healing properties, and the saliva of a holy man was thought to have special powers. Jesus spread this muddy paste on the man's eyes and told him to go, wash it off in the pool of Siloam. The man does as he is told, and he receives sight. He is miraculously cured, and he can see for the very first time. How do his friends and neighbors react to this miracle? Some believe it, but others are skeptical. In fact, they assume it wasn't even the same man. It is an imposter. But he insists repeatedly, I am the man. Yet they refused to believe. They ask him, then how were your eyes opened? 
The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said, Go to Siloam and wash. I went and washed and received my sight. They asked him where Jesus is, but he does not know. Still refusing to believe the man, they take him to the Pharisees so they can investigate the healing. When the man told them that Jesus was the one who healed him, they would not even consider the possibility. Is that really a surprise? The Pharisees hated Jesus and they would not give him credit for anything. No amount of evidence was going to convince them because they already had their minds made up. The Pharisees immediately began to criticize and find fault. After all, that is what they did best. Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. Once again, he broke the rules. The rigid law was more important than grace. They discount the miracle saying that Jesus is a sinner, that he is not from God, and that he did not observe the Sabbath. Now the Pharisees flat out do not believe the man's story, so they call his parents in to question him. And this is what they had to say. We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. They were careful not to say anything about Jesus because the Pharisees had made it clear that anyone who confessed Jesus as Messiah would be put out of the synagogue, which means to be excommunicated. They suggest that the Pharisees, again, question their son. And they certainly do. They weren't about to let this matter go unsettled. The healed man gets a little aggravated at them. They've already been through this once. He doesn't know whether Jesus is a sinner or not. All he knows is that he was blind and now he can see. That is all that matters anyway. Of course, the Pharisees refuse to give any credit to Jesus and proudly say that they are disciples of Moses. They drive the man out, which means they put him out of the synagogue. After hearing this, Jesus went to look for the man. He found him and talks with him. The man turns in faith to Jesus and worships him. Now this man not only has physical sight, but spiritual sight. He is a changed man and receives new life. The passage ends by Jesus making a few remarks about spiritual blindness. Jesus says, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see and those who do see may become blind. And the Pharisees say, surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus replies, but now that you say we see, your sin remains. There appear to be two very different kinds of blindness in this story. There is the man who was physically blind and received his sight, but there are others, the Pharisees, who are spiritually blind, yet they did not know it. First, the blind man, he was lost in every sense of the word. He wasn't looking for anything. Then Jesus came to him, revealed himself to the man, and gave him sight. The man's eyes were opened, and he saw who Jesus was and what he did for him. Then the man comes to Jesus in faith, when he positively responded to Jesus' question, Will you believe? The man fell at Jesus' feet and worshipped him. In his book, Enjoy God, Lloyd Ogilvy writes, One of the most astounding achievements in ophthalmological surgery is the implanting of a lens in the human eye. After a friend of mine had this surgery in both eyes and the bandages were removed, he exclaimed, how wonderful to have new eyes. Our hearts have eyes. Before conversion, our inner eyes are clouded over with cataracts blocking our vision. We cannot see ourselves, others, and life in the clear light of truth. Nor can we behold God's true nature or see the beauty of the world he has given us to enjoy. We are spiritually blinded. Conversion begins the healing of our heart eyes by removing our spiritual cataracts. We understand what the cross means for our forgiveness, but we still do not perceive all that the Lord has planned for us and the power he has offered to us. We need a supernatural lens implant in the eyes of our hearts. 
Now, not only did the blind man receive physical sight, he also received spiritual sight. The Pharisees, who should have had spiritual sight, were blind. They thought they had all the answers. They were religious purists, not aware of their own shortcomings. They judged others, pointed out everyone else's mistakes, found fault with everything, and criticized unmercifully. And that's exactly what they did when Jesus healed the blind man. Because he broke the Sabbath, but he had good reason to, they refused to believe that Jesus had healed the blind man. They were arguing over non-essential and trying to call, catch Jesus in a sin. They could not see Jesus for who he really was. They were blind to God's power, glory, and grace. They saw Jesus' work staring them in the face, yet they refused to accept him. They refused to acknowledge their blindness. Jesus says that their sin remains. Centuries before this blind man was approached by Jesus, the Greek philosopher Plato told this story. In his allegory of the cave, he depicted a group of people who had lived their whole life in a cave, looking at shadows on a wall. Because they had never been in the light outside the cave, they believed the shadows to be the only true reality. At one point, one of their numbers was let out of the cave and then returned to tell the others what they were missing, but they would not believe him. Living in the darkness to which they were accustomed was comfortable. They chose to remain blind because they thought they could see. Now, although Plato wrote this allegory some four to five hundred years earlier, we see this truth replayed in today's gospel. One person gained sight, but the Pharisees, blind as they were, refused to see. It would have forced them to change attitudes they were not about to let go of. Is it possible that this same truth is replayed in our lives? John Newton, the author of the beloved hymn Amazing Grace, referred to himself as a wretch who was lost and blind. He was engaged in the practice of capturing natives from West Africa to be sold into slavery. One day, during a fierce storm, the grace of God put fear in the heart of this man. Scared of a possible shipwreck, Newton read The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis. Newton was led to a genuine conversion, and his life was dramatically changed. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Each of us is spiritually blind in one way or another. Too often, just like the Pharisees, we refuse to see. Living in the darkness to which we are accustomed is familiar and comfortable. But in our blindness, Jesus approaches each of us. And in our lostness, Jesus finds us. Let him open our eyes that we may truly see. Amen. Thank you.